<laughs> well, you may be wondering, how is it that I get to open this conference and close the conference? Well, in fact, until Saturday night, I didn't know I was even on this panel. Uh, I had ignored a lot of Henry's subsequent emails after the first one, and the first one didn't have me on this panel. Fortunately, Saturday night, I looked at the current schedule and realized I had to come up with something. So in light of what Steve just said, I thought I would think great thoughts, or big thoughts, is that what you used? Uh, but don't worry, it won't, it won't be that painful. I want to make three points. The first about governmental powers, the second about trust in public and private institutions, and the third is about financial flows. First point, the discussion today is really about power, not personality. And Alice Fisher and I have gone back and forth about this on a previous occasion. I have no doubt that those working in the Justice Department, including my sister, are extremely well motivated. That doesn't matter. What counts is the question of separation of powers. The framers of our Constitution recognized they couldn't trust anyone, even themselves. Their understanding was that separation of powers was the only way, ultimately, to guarantee liberty because the Constitution had to be more than simply a paper document. It had to build powerful institutions that would be separated and that would check each other in the process. The basic problem that we're facing in the area of federal criminal law generally, including corporate crime, is really with the Congress, and that is what the framers were focused on. That is, they realized that the most dangerous branch in a democratic system is actually the Congress because it is the most powerful. They therefore sought to weaken the Congress by cutting it in two and making it so it didn't, the two houses didn't cooperate very well, and strengthening the two other branches. It is as if in Washington, people use the term, the Congress is the 800-pound gorilla, and the other two are really midgets, but artificially, we have elevated the judiciary and the executive branch. And when Congress reacts as it does to public outrage, you can expect that. But we have independent courts to resist the mob or lynch mob mentality. That's what separation of powers is in large part about. The problem in this context is that the executive branch likes very broad statutes. Not that prosecutors have any bad intent, but as the former head of the public integrity section said to me when I debated him at the ABA a couple years ago, he said, don't stop us from getting the bad guys. Who knows who the bad guys are? That's the fundamental problem. Too much discretion violates basic principles of the rule of law. The courts, since about 1970, as Judge, previously Professor John Noonan has noted, have been engaged in, or were engaged in, effectively creating a common law of crimes. The difficulty in the political process is that there is no constituency, not even the ACLU, which goes after procedural and death penalty and, and First Amendment issues. There is no constituency against the expansion of federal criminal law, and you're not going to run for office by saying, I protected you in Washington by stopping all of these statutes, because your opponent is going to say you were soft on crime. The issue is ultimately and always is, does a statute, a criminal statute, give fair notice of what is prohibited so that people can conform their conduct. Second, my point is trust. The Constitution was concerned about trust of investors. Sometimes federal judges and certainly law professors teaching procedure forget this, that the importance of federal diversity jurisdiction was to get around the biases of states, in particular state legislators, in order that investors would feel confident that they could go out into the boondocks and invest their money. At the time, investment capital, or whatever it was at the time, 
was basically in the seaports where the trade occurred. It was a matter of moving those money flows from the coast inland. Today, we have the same problem internationally, and third world countries don't understand why investors don't want to invest in their countries. It's the same problem. If you don't have a rule of law system, you're not going to have the confidence, the trust of investors. Separation of powers with the judiciary as an important part of that is absolutely critical, we all know, to the rule of law. Unfortunately, too many, not just prosecutors, but too many lawyers equate the rule of law with the rule of laws. But the rule of law, as understood in the common law, has a strong moral component to it. And what I've been saying and others have been saying about mens rea is all related to the fact that criminal law has historically always been connected with the moral fault. And when we get away from that, we are not only engaging in a diminution of the criminal law, we are actually undermining trust in the laws themselves. Because the reality is that if you are a potential high-profile target, namely you got your name in the newspaper in an unfavorable way, you do not have a great deal of confidence that you will be able to defend yourself in a federal system given the real costs. In state courts, it doesn't cost that much to defend yourself. In a serious federal criminal trial, you're talking real dollars. It can run into the millions. That reality has an impact on our trust. If you wonder about trust, I invite you to come along sometime when I'm doing a survey for AID of foreign countries. And I'm on a kind of rule of law commercial task force where we deal with a number of very interesting issues. And one of the things that we find in underdeveloped countries is that, for one thing, corruption is directly proportional to the amount of the economy controlled by the government. That's one thing. Two, we find in many countries a great deal of distrust of government, of the institutions, of the security of their property. And that's why they get the money out of those countries. Those countries are unstable because they don't have the rule of law. But they have a constitution and they have all kinds of laws. But it is formalistic. They have a law that's on the books, but that is not the law in practice. And when you have formalism, you have a great deal of discretion. And when you have discretion, you have corruption and uncertainty. This is a situation that we ought to take very seriously. When you look at Latin America in particular, did you realize that until a couple of years ago, there is no equivalent of Article 9 anywhere in Latin America? Peru was the first to get one. Guatemala is on the cusp of getting one and Honduras. That's it. Think about the difference in your economy if you don't have Article 9 or its equivalent. Why don't they have it? They criminalize, they told us, all kinds of things that are permissible under Article 9. Now, do they actually enforce it? No, but it's on the books as criminal. My point is that, unfortunately, unwittingly, with the best of intentions, we may well be creating a wonderful third world economy. Third point, financial flows. There was a statement in the last panel about the way to restore trust in the financial markets and to get people investing again in the markets was to make sure that we're prosecuting people to the fullest so that people have confidence. Well, if I'm not mistaken, there's been pretty aggressive prosecution since about 2002 at least. That didn't have any deterrent effect on Madoff, unfortunately. But I've got to say that what he did and what others like him did, did a great deal to destroy trust. You talk to people today about where they're willing to put their money. Trust is what the American financial system had going for it. Think about it. 
Although people want retribution after the fact, do they want instead a competent system that they can rely on? Or would they rather have primarily a series of prosecutions? See, the problem is with assumptions that lawyers bring in. The assumption of the last, the person who made the statement on the last panel was somehow that it's criminal enforcement that gives businessmen confidence. Businessmen don't like to deal with lawyers. CEOs and general counsel are largely two ships passing in the night who do not think alike. CEOs are optimistic. Why else would they have ventured into something that other people think is crazy? Because they think they can do it. The general counsel and the CFO are there as pessimists to tell them all the kinds of things they can't and shouldn't do because of all these risks. A proper balance is required, but that is different from what we've heard about Sarbanes-Oxley with lawyers running the operation. The reason I came to know about some of this was because we had a think tank at our university and it involved private intelligence and we dealt with corporations and I can attest to the very important point that Professor Ribstein made about information costs. Corporations are not able to capture their information, even when they want to. It is extremely difficult. Businesses, ask yourself about whether Sarbanes-Oxley really restored any trust. Why is it that prior to Sarbanes-Oxley, 90% of all international IPOs occurred in New York? Since Sarbanes-Oxley, 90% of international IPOs occur in London. It's gotten to the point, it's even gotten Senator Schumer's attention. It ought to. If London replaces New York as the financial capital of the world, that is significant, is it not? Earlier, Roscoe Howard said, well, gee, be thankful at least that this is not China. Well, yeah, for the time being. Now you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, for one thing, they own our country right now in terms of treasuries. We know that Secretary of State Clinton was over there basically begging to continue buying treasuries. We know that China and Russia and others want to get away from the dollar as the international currency. They want to go to something else. Economists understand what the consequences of this will be. By and large, Americans don't understand it. There is a huge gulf between the rule of law as understood in the West and the understanding in China. I taught last summer in Hong Kong and I'll be going back and yesterday I visited with one of the students that I had and she is here at the University of Chicago and she is studying and she said, you know, in China we've never been able to understand the U.S. concern about human rights. We just don't get it. But I came over here and I took a course on human rights and, and now I'm beginning to understand. Think about it. What do our notions of human rights ultimately depend upon? They depend upon our understanding of individual responsibility, a certain moral code. And if we turn all of that over in terms of expediency, and we fail to be competent in government, what are we doing? I suggest to you that engagement between the U.S. and China is very good, but it's often the stronger power in terms of willpower that ultimately is influential. I teach a chapter out of a book written by a Chinese Filipino with American citizenship, and this is his message to China. It is this, we want Western capitalism but not Western democracy. It's too unruly. Authoritarian capitalism. If we don't maintain our traditional understandings and remember why we have them, 
we will not be able to overcome the notion in the world that those with power and force prevail. Thank you.